Navigating troubled waters, Turkish and Greek officials resume talks over their maritime dispute. Can diplomacy diffuse recent tensions? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Well, Turkey and Greece have been disputing their maritime boundaries for decades. And last year, the two nations came close to war when Ankara deployed a survey vessel in contested waters. Now, after a five-year suspension of their direct talks, the NATO allies are back at the negotiating table. Discussions to resolve the standoff in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean kicked off on Monday, but they were preceded by disagreements over the agenda. Athens wants to limit them to continental shelf borders and the size of exclusive economic zones. But Ankara says other issues, including differences over aerial zones and some Aegean islands, should be tackled. Sinem Kosoglu reports from Istanbul. Turkey and Greece have opposite approaches when it comes to the delimitation of the contested maritime borders. And uh, the resumption of these exploratory talks that took place 60 times before uh, uh, since 2002 uh, comes at a time of mutual mistrust, uh, arms race and a very aggressive rhetoric. Uh, tensions sparked especially when President Erdogan said that he will open his country's borders to the EU for the thousands of irregular migrants last year. And then last summer, both sides competed claims over the deep sea gas reserves. And Turkey sent a seismic survey vessel to the Eastern Mediterranean, very close to Greek territorial waters. Greece totally uh, was against this. But there's one thing in common. Both countries are going through a, a domestic, political and economical slump. Uh, and Turkey faces possible U.S. sanctions uh, because it purchased Russian S-400 missile systems. And the United States says that that's a breach uh, for Turkey as a NATO ally. So two countries again uh, come together uh, to discuss the bilateral issues in the agency. Many believe that since those issues both sides represent are seen as sovereignty, national sovereignty issues by both sides, they, are not comp uh, they will uh, never compromise on any of those issues. But they want to show the United States and the Western countries that they are not avoiding any kind of diplomatic dialogue. Also, many say that both Turkey and Greece are trying to gain time as Turkey is stuck with its problems with the United States and the European Union and economy and Greece trying to raise its arms uh, buying new weapons from other countries. Sinem Kosolo for Inside Story. And Turkey and Greece have overlapping claims to areas of gas-rich waters in the eastern Mediterranean. They've each sought to strengthen their territorial claims by drawing up exclusive economic zones with Libya and Egypt respectively. Greece says each of its islands is entitled to its own continental shelf with exclusive drilling rights. Turkey disputes that. Ankara also wants to ensure the Turkish Republic of Cyprus has equal rights to gas fields. It's not internationally recognized, though, as an independent state. Last year, Turkey stepped up drilling along the north coast of Cyprus, angering Greece, which claims the area as part of its continental shelf. And last week, Athens extended its western territorial waters from six nautical miles to 12. That's around 22 kilometers. Ankara opposes that. Well, let's bring in our guest now. Joining us from Nicosia in Cyprus, we have Andreas Theophanos. He's the president of the Cyprus Center for European and International Affairs. In Rome, we have Natalie Tocci. She is the director of the Institute of International Affairs and a former advisor to Federica Mogherini, the European Union's foreign affairs chief. And in London, we have Galeb Dalai. He's a researcher at the University of Oxford. Welcome to you all. So perhaps I could start with Andreas and ask the question, do you think this round of talks will succeed, Andreas? Well, I wish I could be optimistic in that sense, but if I take into consideration Ankara's rhetoric and also the stated positions on various issues uh, involving Greco-Turkish relations, 
as well as the Cyprus question, I uh, would be very hesitant to express optimism. Let me say that uh, the differences between the two countries, you know, Greece and Turkey, in relation to... Before you do that, uh, Andreas, let me jump in and ask this question. The fact that they have started talking, is that a success in itself? Is it something of a success a to the Turkish perspective, which is this needs to be sorted out in bilateral talks? It's a positive step. I mean, negotiations and trying to find uh, peaceful ways to address issues, I think it's always welcome. I think, you know, Greece has also been positive to discussions. Now, as it was mentioned in the report previously, there are some issues of procedures. I mean, Greece uh, indicates that it will be the two issues to be discussed are the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone to be delimited, okay? And any other issues should not be discussed. Now, why do we have this statement? Because Ankara, Erdogan himself, and other Turkish officials have been raising the issue of revising the Treaty of Lausanne. And this is not acceptable to Greece, in the sense that uh, Greece indicates that it will not discuss and address the revisionist uh, claims of Turkey. If there are issues to be addressed, yes, but uh, that treaty it says there is no need to go back and, and try to find uh, issues over the islands in the Aegean and so on and so on. All right, let's bring in the perspective of uh, Gallup, if we could, in London. Gallup, it, listening to what Andreas is explaining there, I think it underlines the fact that Turkey and Greece haven't really agreed. They may have agreed to start talking, but what exactly to talk about is not entirely in agreement, right? Well, I think let's first, we have to be clear. At this stage, we are talking about crisis management, not crisis solution, given the fact that the set of the issues that Turkey and Greece are discussing are quite intractable set of the problems. Some of them has been there uh, as you know, as far back, uh, the root of it goes to, as far back uh, as to the foundation of the both states. So at this stage, we are talking about the crisis management, so it does not culminate it in, in an incident or accident that will, you know, that will uh, further, uh, that will make the resolution of anything is impossible. From this perspective, it is a positive sign that they are talking, because when the talk resumes, that takes away the focus from the military standing or breath standing to the negotiation. At this stage, I think two things is essential for the for de-escalation. One of them is the moratorium, uh, some form of like you know hitting the stop button on the energy exploration. It's actually happening right now. I mean, quietly Turkey has not been sending the Orish race into the contested waters for some time. And then secondly, it means like you know talks. Uh, negotiations and this is like you know with this exploratory talks that is resuming uh, today and I think the third one is in one way or another if the talks uh, if the Turks progresses the question that will be in front of us that will be how to bring Turkey into the East Mediterranean gas forum or a gas game in one way or another because it is the perception of Turkey that it is being cut out from an emerging security and energy order in the Eastern Mediterranean that motivates it to utilize the coercive diplomacy. Okay, Galib, let me, let me interrupt standard. you as well now. Let me jump in there because that's a really interesting point you've mentioned. Let me take that, if we could, to Natalie in Rome and ask you from the perspective of the European Union, from your understanding, do you think the EU wants to see this problem resolved or, you know, resolved as in, finally, as, as Galib would say, let Turkey into the Eastern Mediterranean gas game? Or is it just about ensuring that things don't boil over? That's all the EU wants to see is let's not have a war in the Eastern Mediterranean and maybe have some attempt at curbing Turkish power in the area. Well, I mean, I think sort of tying together what Andreas and, and Gallic was, was, was saying, I think in an ideal world, obviously the European Union would like to see these talks uh, eventually lead to a resolution. Uh, of not only the Greece-Turkey uh, set of issues that we were discussing, uh, but eventually that this would have positive 
spillover effects uh, onto the Cyprus conflict, uh, onto the broader uh, energy conundrum in the region, uh, and perhaps even having spillover effects, positive spillover effects on issues such as Libya, for example. So this is obviously, you know, in an ideal world. And the point is, of course, and here I share Andreas's pessimism, uh, we don't live in an ideal world. Uh, and therefore, does the European Union prefer uh, the kind of, as Gary was mentioning, conflict management situation which existed uh, in the 2000s, uh, in a sense being spurred by the rapprochement between the two countries after the 1999 earthquakes, or does it prefer the escalatory dynamics that we saw over the summer and the autumn? Well, obviously it prefers uh, the former to the latter, and given that we do live in an imperfect world, um, it will obviously be better at the very least to have that uh, conflict management set up uh, to ensure that, on the one hand, Turkey's uh, assertive and at times aggressive behavior is, is curbed, and that eventually the different forms of cooperation in the region uh, that we've been seeing, bilateral, trilateral, multilateral, are actually forms of cooperation that become more inclusive in nature, uh, beginning with the energy field. All right, maybe we should, uh, let's go back actually to Gallup for a second. Gallup, uh, Put, let's put this in context for, for the viewers just for a, a second and run us through the issues at stake here, the issues which are disputed between Turkey and Greece, because they're quite, you know, they, they range from the whole Cyprus issue, which I think, you know, most people would know something about, to some of the details of like where the territorial waters end, right? Where does the continental shelf end? How do you do, do you apply that to islands as well as the mainland? Exclusive economic zones. And then there's, you know, aerial zones and space. And it gets quite complicated, right? There is, there's a lot, in other words, to talk about. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, we are talking about different settled and maritime disputes, be it in Aegean, starting with uh, uh, territorial waters, but also Turkey bring to the table the contestation of the ownership of the several island and isles, which Greek says that, you know, this is effectively infringing on my sovereignty in Eastern Mediterranean. It's the, uh, it's the continental shelf plus, like, you know, economic exclusive zones, but also you have, like, uh, the Cyprus crisis, which is basically poisoning the whole atmosphere of the relationship. And now on the top of this Greek-Turkish bilateral dispute, you have the energy exploration starting from 2009-10 Israel and then uh, and the gas pipeline and then Cyprus and then 2015 Egypt and then the Libyan crisis in which like, you know, Turkey right, signs... Let me, uh, Gallup, and, let me put this point to you. From the Greek perspective, they would say it might be a lot easier if only Turkey would just simply adhere to international law. Uh, whether it's to do with its presence in Cyprus, which the Greeks see as an occupation, they should get out of there, or whether it's about, you know, territorial waters, just recognize the, the law of the seas, which gives countries the right to go all the way to 12 miles. Well, I think, I mean, uh, in, in Cyprus previously, there was a UN process in, uh, in 2014. There was also a voting on this. There was a UN resolution on the site, and then the Turkish site uh, uh, supported by the 65%, and then the Greek side uh, rejected by 75%. So there was a UN process on Cyprus. But when it comes to the international law perspective on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, other set of the disputes, I think in the end, in one way or another, we will end up, you know, in international arbitration. But the question is exactly what we discussed at the beginning: what to take to the international court, because. There is a disagreement on what to be taken to the international court as well, too, because what one side descri describes as dispute, the other side describes as its sovereignty. So therefore, like you know, as long as you have this glaring gap between the both sides' narrative, whether what is like a, a dispute and what is a sovereignty issue, then you know, taking the issue to the international court at this stage is quite unlikely. Uh, right. Okay. And that's what. Let me give a chance to Andreas. Andreas, why is Athens resisting discussing all the issues? If you're going back to talks, surely put everything on the table. Well, let me put it this way. I mean, I mean, Turkish officials, including Erdogan himself, do not conceal their objectives. They want to, they want Turkey in 1923 to be a bigger country than what it is right now. I mean, for decades, there is a record of Turkish expansionism. 
uh, there is a, a record of revisionism. Talking about Cyprus, I mean, since that was mentioned. Yeah, but, um, without going into too I, much I, of the history of the details, because I know, Andrew, no, 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 so we no, can no, get bogged but, down, but, but, but my, my point is, way. why not, if you're sitting you, to talk, why not talk about everything? Well, let me put it this way. If Greece also starts talking about everything, I, I think that things would be made worse. In the sense, I mean, like you say not to talk about history, but although we must be forward looking, we cannot escape from history and the record of it. Talking about Cyprus, when Turkey invaded in 1974, it declared that its objective was to reestablish constitutional order and protect the Turkish Cypriot community. In practice, it has destroyed the constitutional order in Cyprus. It has occupied 37 percent. It applied ethnic cleansing. It has colonized Cyprus to the extent that the Turkish Cypriots are minority in the occupied part. And at this stage right now, they are trying to colonize the city of Varosha, which was supposed to be returned in 1977. Talking about the UN well, planning the, tool for uh, Andreas, race. Uh, this is this is Please. exactly what I'm trying to avoid getting into. You know, claims of ethnic cleansing and counterclaims and, and the history. But, but it's not. Uh, claims. Let me put it, the question this way, Andreas. If the it if happened. the two sides are going to decide where the territorial waters are or where the continental shelf is, don't you have to kind of have to resolve whose islands these are and and that you know some addressed. some of the broader issues about the the presence of you know, uh, or the, the, the makeup of Cyprus in terms of uh, political order, that would make it a lot easier to decide where the exclusive zones start and end, wouldn't it? Okay. Let me put it this way. Where the islands belong, there's a, the Treaty of Lausanne, and that's very clear. If we respect treaties, that's clear. What is at, what should be discussed, what could be is disputed, is the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone. And there is international law for that. But in addition to international law, okay, when there are certain differences and different interpretations, uh, things can be discussed. Now, in the case of Cyprus, since you brought it again, you know, we cannot take positions a la carte. Would Turkey give the Kurds in Turkey what is asking for the Turkish Cypriots in Cyprus? Uh, Cyprus is a country less than 10,000 square kilometers, and Turkey would like to have... Uh, exclusive, uh, you know, to set up constituent states. Uh, it wants to set quotas about who lives where on that. Why doesn't that pra is practice in Turkey? And wants, to, you know, what comes out to the Greek perspective, both in Athens and Nicosia, is that Ankara would like a resolution that would turn Cyprus into a protectorate and also to change the demographic structure. All right. And identity okay. of Cyprus through right. colonization. So I think Andres, these, okay, unfortunately, the, okay. the point these is, unfortunately, the, the, po the point is clear. I think you've made that there's a lack of trust in, in Turkish intentions and, and, and what the Greeks say, only, see as expansionism. See, let me, if I see, can, let me, because we haven't got a lot of time, let me give a chance to Natalie. It's, I think, even clear from just listening to the discussion in this show that there isn't a lot of common ground even on what the issues are. Um, why have talks even begun at this point? What made them possible? They've been stalled for years. Was it a change in the U.S. administration? I think certainly the change in the U.S. administration made a big difference. It made a big difference because ultimately the last four years uh, under the Trump administration were really characterized by, not on the one hand, very erratic U.S. behavior, and on the other, and perhaps even more importantly, a profound disconnect between the European Union and the United States. Uh, now all the regional parties, beginning with Greece and Turkey, know that there is transatlantic sync. Uh, there will be coordination moving forward. Uh, and this obviously also creates a completely different climate, for instance, within NATO. And we know that NATO has been a prime actor. The Secretary General has been a prime actor in actually ensuring that uh, the talks between Greece and Turkey resume. So I think this broader international context makes a big difference. Alongside this, obviously, there are the economic woes that uh, Turkey is in, uh, obviously the threat of, uh, of EU sanctions. There are interests in, uh, in Greece, particularly as far as uh, the military domain is concerned and, uh, and defence contracts. So I think there are sort of incentives on both sides, perhaps not necessarily in actually reaching an agreement, but certainly mitigating 
uh, conflict and sort of embarking on a de-escalatory dynamic. Okay, let me bring Gallup in. Gallup, I, I'm assuming you probably want to come back at a lot of some of the historical points which uh, Mr. Andreas was uh, mentioning there. But if I can, try and get us to focus a little bit more on the now rather than the ancient history of this. Um, why? I'll, is one way of looking at this as perhaps Turkey being a little bit on the back foot, feeling the heat from some of those factors which uh, Natalie mentioned, whether it's a closer transatlantic alliance or the EU sanctions? Is that what's happening? Well, certainly all those have a uh, quite significant impact. I mean, one of the, uh, let's not forget, one of the major reasons that led to the crisis in Eastern Mediterranean was the systemic factors. Two things was important. One of them is the, the U.S. withdrawal uh, from the areas because historically when there was crisis between Turkey and then Greece, like uh, we saw many of them in 1990s, the U.S. would step in to de-escalate the tension of, between the two NATO allies. The second, way, the second one is the loss of the EU accession framework. Uh, in Turkish-Greek relations, because in late 1990s, early 2000s, you saw the golden, uh, you saw the honeymoon period in Turkish-Greek relations, and this was against the backdrop of the Turkish, uh, Turkish quest to uh, to be a member of the European Union. So the disappearance of both of them has uh, has basically aggravated the crisis. But now, on the top of these factors, uh, there are like you know new factors. One of them. This military posturing in the Eastern Mediterranean is an expensive thing, both for Turkey but for Greece as well too. The narrative that Turkey has been advocating for the talk, so in this regard there isn't change of the position uh, in terms of like you know uh, advocating for the advocating for the uh, for the uh, negotiation. And then the most immediate factors are, as Natalie put it. The change of the government in the U.S. because now, highly likely, we will see more convergence but it, but between hang the on, European Gallup, and it, Americans. Is Turkey changing its position as well because of that? Uh, it withdrew the Oruç Reis uh, seismic survey ship, right, in December. Was that one of the signs? I mean, the Cavusoglu, the foreign minister of Turkey, called it positive messages that Turkey was sending positive measures, messages rather. Was that really Turkey changing its policy because it saw? The, re the global situation changing against it. It's changing its tactics. It's changing its tactics because the policy hasn't changed. The policy, I mean, all the set of the crises uh, that has been, like, you know, with us uh, are still with us. Right now, the only thing that has changed in Turkey is not sending the ships into the con contested waters. So that's the only thing that has changed since the last time. Uh, so I think if the, if the talks resumes and progress, uh, highly likely, we will not see the uh, will not see the ships going into the contested water anytime soon. But we should not exclude the fact that the ship might go into the contested waters if the things get worse as uh, as well. So on this regard, I will not overextend. I will not overstate the importance of the change of the government in U.S. It certainly is important. The deterioration of the economy right. in Turkey is certainly affected. All right, well. we've just got a minute left. I'm going to try and give it to Andreas and ask the same kind of question to Andreas. But do you think that the changing global situation will strengthen the Greek position in talks or at least embolden it and lead it to believe it, it has a stronger position right now? The issue is that the, when we have negotiations, when we have negotiations at any point in time, uh, the balance or imbalance of power influences the outcome. Uh, so far, Turkey has been trying to use gunboat diplomacy in all aspects in its disputes uh, in Cyprus and with Greece in order to push for its positions. I would say that the European Union has been uh, tolerating to a great extent Turkey, but if the, you know, since this is repeated, it begins to show that Turkish revisionism is destabilizing. In the case of the United States, we had Trump, who also um, tolerated to a great extent uh, President Erdogan. And the issue is whether the new U.S. administration would follow up accordingly. Right. And I would say, finishing up my thoughts, what you mentioned earlier that it's about ancient history, it's not ancient history. It's, it's, it's a few years ago, I mean, and what has been taking place. The issue is that I have no doubt in my mind that if Turkey is to respect the territorial integrity and the right of existence of neighboring countries to exist, I think 
there can be cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean, encouraged both right. by the European Union and the United States of America. Right. If Turkey maintains its revisionist uh, attitude and policies, I think the maximum that can be done uh, by other uh, powers is conflict management. Thank you very much, Andreas, there for your thoughts. Let's try and end on hopes for de-escalation. Eh? Let's thank also Gallup Dalai in London and Natalie, of course, Tocci in Rome. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now, it's goodbye.